Okay. Welcome everybody. We're delighted to see you here and delighted to re-invite uh, Andrea Tuttle to talk to our Brown Bag Lunch uh, members. Andrea is a biologist who went into environmental policy for her career and focused especially on forests and climate policy. She has attended many of the United Nations climate negotiations and serves on the boards of the Pacific Forest Trust and the Save the Redwoods League which celebrate many wins for conservation and climate policy. She's also the former head of the California State Department of Forestry under Governor Gray Davis. Still an active retiree, she is occasionally consulting and focused on understanding the thinking globally side to complement acting locally. During retirement, she's also found plenty of enjoyment in traveling on natural history and birding trips, particularly in the high and low polar latitudes. And now we'll turn it over to Andrea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm hitting the share button and now it's not not wanting to share. Let me try this again. We we had all this practiced and then and then uh, okay, let's give this a try. All right, do you see that? Yes. Okay. But I also see the part on the side. It says There right. you go. There you we it. go. Okay, I want to um yeah. All right. Hi everybody. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get rid of the chatter on this screen. Okay. Um, thank you, Jane and Ollie, for inviting me to give another brown bag presentation. I see a couple of familiar faces out there and some new, new friends. Um, some of you may remember that I did a presentation a couple of years ago about a, a trip I had taken to South Georgia Island, which is east of the Falklands, just north of Antarctica. And at that time, I was so enthused <clears throat> with that island that when I saw the opportunity to go to another set of islands, which are at the same latitude, but on the other side of the globe, um, I took it. And so this December, I went with National Geographic on a boat, on a cruise, uh, through New Zealand, and then down to this sub-Antarctic islands. So let's get started, and you'll you'll get an um, you'll get an idea of what all this looks like. So I'm entitling this, "Where the Heck Are the Snares." And the reason I did this is because people ask me, oh, where have you been on your recent trip? And I say, oh, I've just had this great trip to the Snares and Macquarie Islands. And they say, oh, great. But you know that you can tell that their brains are spinning and they have absolutely no clue where the snares are. Because uh, most people in the U.S. don't know uh, where these islands are. They don't know about them. And... Um, um, and, and it's not, it's not on the traditional tourist, uh, track. So, um, let me advance a slide here. Okay. So the snares are below New Zealand. They're a rocky island group, uh, in the, sub-Antarctic latitudes, I'll show that to you in a second here, between New Zealand and Antarctica. So first of all, I want to give um, credit to those whose photos I'm using here. My photos are of the landscape uh, scenes, but the ship provides for um, all the photographers on the ship, the passengers and the crew, to share their best photos. And in particular, there's a photographer, Tom Coates, who has a terrific eye and great lenses. And so all the really beautiful bird shots are, are Tom's. So I wanna give him credit. Okay, so what is the sub-Antarctic? Well, it's a zone about 46 to 60 degrees south. There's no land mass there. 
And so you get extreme winds, that, which are whipping around the globe at that point. In the winter, it's cold, it's snowy. But the time I went in December, which is their summer, um, we had windows of actual sunshine and fairly uh, mild conditions, although windy. But you can see here are the islands that I'm talking about, these New Zealand islands in this latitude zone. And here's South Georgia. So they're, they're very parallel in their location. If you were to look at the um, comparable latitude in the north, it would be about where Labrador is and Kamchatka um, Peninsula. So why would anybody want to go here? Well, for me, of course, it was remote, it's exotic, and it's a great adventure, and it piqued my interest. Um, and also, because these islands are so isolated, many endemic species have evolved here, and they evolved without the presence of predators. And so you get some unique species that you will only see here and you won't see anyplace else. You find very large teeming breeding colonies of albatross and petrels and uh, other marine um, mammals and birds. So there's that side of it, the natural history side. And then the story I really want to present here is the story of recovery. These islands have been decimated by sailors who brought in invaders, invasive species. So in recent years, in the, say the last 20 years, the governments of New Zealand, Tasmania, which is up over here on the left, and Australia have um, tried to restore, just like the Galapagos, they've tried to restore the native populations so that these endemic species can thrive. Here are the particular islands that I visited. This whole group are the, are the um, sub-Antarctic, but here's Antarctica. Here's as far south as we got in Macquarie. I'll tell you a little bit about Campbell also. We'll have a few photos here, uh, Enderby and Hardwick. And here are our snares. Um, and camp, yeah, uh, the Snares Islands were really the first port we were, or not port, but island group we were supposed to see. But the weather was so ferocious that we changed the itinerary. But at the end of the day, these are the um, islands that we actually visited. So this is a story that's the same as what I gave at um, the South Georgia presentation. Why are there such large populations of, of uh, breeding birds and mammals? Well, the answer is, this is a zone of web welling, meaning that nutrients are being brought to the surface um, through this, um, physical upwelling of the water. Here are, here's Antarctica, and here's the bottom of the globe, and here are the Macquarie and Snares Islands, and here's South Georgia over here, and the wind whips around here. So the mechanism is that cold water uh, that flows off of Antarctica, it melts and it flows off, and it's heavy and it sinks but it gets caught up by the winds and it eventually meets up with this outer zone of warmer ocean water. And this is called the area of Antarctic convergence. And so you get this upwelling of the water and the nutrients are brought up, which forms um, the basis for a very rich food chain. So here's the food chain the Antarctic food web, so that so the nutrients are upwelling and they support heavy populations of phytoplankton, very small um, plant organisms, which are then eaten by um, herbivorous, zo by zooplankton, the little um, animal plankton and carnivorous zooplankton. And all of this plankton feeds the krill. And the krill is really the basis of the food chain for all the rest of the Antarctic. Uh, krill are like little tiny uh, shrimp. 
And mm -hmm. you may know, um, um, oh, in that omega-3 phase, they were um, uh, uh, fishing and overfishing huge quantities of krill. It's a teeming, teeming mess. But the basic food chain in, in the Ar Antarctic, it feeds the fish, it feeds the squid. And from there, off we go to all the predators, the seals, the, the birds, the penguins, the elephant seals, and then eventually your top predators of the various whales. So just overall, this is uh, what the trip was. Um, I flew to Auckland, you get on the ship, you meet the group, get on the ship, and we, we scalloped around uh, the North Island and stopped at these places. And then we, I'm not talking about those on this, on this presentation. Um, then we came down to Milford Sound and then we took this big dive down and spent most of our time in these islands and then ended up in Dunedin um, and flew home from there. This was the ship, it's a National Geographic Orion. Uh, we we only had 59 passengers on the whole thing and about 100 crew. <clears throat> and it, the trip lasted about, about three weeks um, on the ship. And every day you have a zodiac. Here are the zodiacs on the back. And each day they lower these down. And that's how where we spend most of our time is on these zodiacs. And here they are being lowered down. You bundle yourself up. You're on about five different layers, starting with your warm thermals at the base layer, and then several layers underneath your, your rain jacket, and then you have your life jacket, and eventually your gloves. Um, and each day you come down these stairs, and they have it very well uh, orchestrated so that you are safe uh, being handed off and settled down into the zodiacs, and then off you go. One of the best parts about National Geographic and actually most of the Arctic and Antarctic trips is that they have excellent naturalists. So there's six um, specialists in, in all different areas. And they also have the professional photographers that NetGeo um, provides on the ship for the passengers to talk to and have lectures from. So that's a, a great part of the, of the experience. I had a nice little cabin with windows and a nice little marble bathroom. And I was right next to the bridge. I was on the top deck. So I was next to the bridge where you can walk in at any time, talk to the crew, see the navigation charts. And, and uh, it's also a great bird watching spot. There's a library for when you're just on the ship, you have, good meals outside if you can, otherwise in the dining room. But to get to the islands themselves, what do you actually see? Well, you see a lot of this. <laughs> you see a lot of water and, and sky. But suddenly, off in the distance, through the mists, you start to see an island group emerging. And all of them pretty much look like this. They're not uh, uh, they don't have a lot of high peaks and glaciated peaks the way South Georgia does, um, but they emerge. So we took this deep dive to go the furthest south to Macquarie because we wanted to take advantage of a, a pocket of good weather. So here we are getting ready <clears throat> to uh, load up the Zodiacs. And this is an isthmus at the very north end where there is a research center um, that is managed by Tasmania through a um, historical story. I don't know all the points, but um, these islands, uh, at least Macquarie does not, does, does not belong to New Zealand. It really is managed by Tasmania and they run a year round research station here, which has done a lot of interesting work. So let's take a little bit um, closer look at Macquarie because it is a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO site, and the reason is because of its geology. If you look, here's New Zealand, and you see this ridge, this marine underwater ridge here, and this is because the plate, the continental plate coming from Australia, the Indo 
Australian plate is meeting up with the Pacific plate and creating this ridge. And at one spot along here, the ridge is exposed. Whoops, is exposed. And what's why the geolog geologists are excited about this is because this is where rocks from the Earth's mantle, much deeper than uh, surficial, su um, surface rocks. So you see these basalts and other special rocks that you only see here. So here's this uh, far end, the Macquarie uh, a Research Station. And here's the island. It's only 20 miles long, three miles wide. This is where we landed the first uh, landing. And here was our second landing, uh, Sandy Bay. And here we are. You, you're just so startled that you actually are on this spot because um, um, it's taken you quite a while to get there. And there's the penguins and there's sort of this stark um, uh, shoreline looks like this. And just take a look at the vegetation because this is pretty close to what it looks like now. It is, this is in recovery phase. This is being revegetated after all the onslaughts that I'm about to tell you about. So here's, here's the greeting party. Here's the skuas. They're, these are predatory birds in the front. Then there's the king penguins here. And then these giant bags of blubber, these huge elephant seals um, that snort and make all kinds of sounds. And then you have the cormorants and the penguins here. So I was looking at these penguins and they just capture your fancy and they're so cute and they're so fun to watch. And I started looking at them closer. I said, oh, what's going on? Look at this. And then you look a little closer you say, oh, for heaven's sakes, they're in their molting phase. And this is what they would have looked like uh, when they were just starting to molt. So this is a huge energy sink for them. Uh, it's energy expensive to grow your next crop of, crop of um, feathers. Um, but that's, what's, that's what they look like when they're in this intermediate uh, molting phase. On the beach, you have the um, beach uh -huh. master. You have a beach master who's the giant um, male who has. Um, it takes okay. care. Of him. He he defends his harem of females, and then you have the juvenile males that are practicing <clears throat> so that they can become the big uh, beach master. That sound is the wind. <laughs> so they're kind of fun to watch as they um, uh, are the teenage males trying to trying to assert their um, their dominance. And then um, we were just at the end of the period where the uh, penguins were calling. I think we lost the sound. Oh. Okay. Well, um, we can try that later. Um, I'm sorry about that. It says to me that it works. So the um, here's the vegetation that is this recovering vegetation. Um, this is called tussock grass. They're big clumps of grass. And then there's um, herbs that they call mega herbs. But there's no trees. You're way too south to have any trees supported at this point. Uh, this is some of the ground cover, kind of a tansy-like plant, a, a composite plant. But you go up and you get a view. Here's the research station up over here. And um, uh, you can see some of these. This is a, a research station. So they have exclosures to see what happens when various um, animals are kept in, grazers are kept in or out. 
This is a closer look at the research station, which, as I mentioned, is managed by Tasmania, and it's a World Heritage Area. These are sort of the dorms and the research buildings here, and we were on the beach here, and we walked across this peninsula. Because of COVID, they didn't invite us into the research station um, itself. So we walked across the isthmus, and you're right close to these lounging elephant seals, so they have a guard that's mostly protecting us from them, although them from us as well. So you're, you're, but you're pretty close to these guys. Let's see if this works. Well, I don't know if you could hear them uh, snuffling and, and making noises, but there, um, there's a lot of, um, of funny noises that they make. Okay, so you're walking along and you start looking at these um, um, elephant seals and you see this white stuff on their nose. You say, okay, what's that about? Well, these guys routinely, they go out to sea and they routinely dive to a thousand feet, even down to 3000 feet. So you can imagine the pressure on these blubbery bodies and it smashes their lungs. Um, sometimes they're down for, the average is that they're down for 20 minutes. Sometimes they're down for, you know, over an hour. So this white stuff is a, a surfactant that in the first place, it helps um, uh, lower the surface tension so that oxygen and CO2 can pass across the lung tissue. But as equally as important, um, it acts as an anti-adhesive. When this huge pressure is compressing their body, the alveoli get all crushed together. So this um, uh, surfactant allows them to open back up again and let the lungs expand when they come back up to the surface. So it's kind of an interesting little factoid about that. So uh, it's this wild look. Um, The penguins are coming up onto shore um, in little little groups, and they come right up to you. You're not supposed to um, uh, go up to them, but they come. They're curious. They come right up to you, and then they just pass right on by. Uh, this there's quite a breeding colony here on Macquarie. Um, maybe you've seen the emperor penguins of Antarctica. They're the next largest, the next larger. Uh, penguin, but these guys are pretty big in their own right. They eat fish and squid, and they dive pretty deep as well. They were not breeding at the time we were there, but this is what their egg is like. They lay one apparently every three years, and they only, um, or their breeding takes up to 14 months, and they only lay one egg. There's another species of penguin also on Macquarie called royal penguins. And this breeding colony is found only here. This is one of these endemics that's found only on this island. There's um, 850,000 nesting pairs and they're considered to be somewhat endangered. And they're cute little guys, they're very fancy. They have uh, this um, fancy hairdo and they're curious, again, they come down off of the top of the island down to the water's edge to go fishing. So these guys are coming out of the water. And they're very curious.
And then they just walk on by. They take a look and they walk on by. Here's another look of them coming down off of the tussock and making their way to the water. Do they come and go at a particular time of day? Um, I I don't know. They were coming and going um, uh, when well when they get hungry. That's <laughs> that's basically uh, what's driving them is that they're hungry and they 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 come down and then they go back up. They tend to be up in the roost or the or the colony uh, at night, but they're pretty cute. Um, they're they're uh, it's fun to fun to watch them and you end up spending quite a bit of time just having taking photos of these guys because they're they're so captivating so that was the royal penguin colony at one end of the bay and at the other end of this bay were the king penguins so this is what they're they're just hanging out here they've probably they're molting but they've probably eaten for now and they're just hanging out and they just make fabulous photos this actually is with a, my cell phone just um looking into that group there it's very artistic they're so so pretty you sort of stare at these different patterns of the orange and the black here you can see up close the how the feathers have a uh, uh, evolved into almost scales. They're very scale-like. They have very leathery feet, a fluffy belly, but all of these feathers are very sleek for going fast in the water, going after going after the fish. And you also note that they spend one heck of a lot of time grooming and picking. <laughs> and I don't know if they have lice or what they have, but uh, there's a lot of this behavior of scratching it the scratching and plucking keeping their plumage uh, but you can see how beautiful this plumage is it's just really really gorgeous so i will i have hundreds more of these penguin photos but i will refrain from showing you any more you get the idea of them okay so then we left macquarie and we headed north to the auckland islands particularly enderby and hardwick and these are just far enough north that they can support a kind of a tree. It's a shrubby tree. Uh, there's no conifers. Um, it's constantly beaten by the wind and it's a stunted forest. And um, here uh, the government has built a boardwalk so that we can walk on a trail and get up onto this island. Underneath the canopy, you can see how unusual this growth pattern is. It's fun to look at that. But this phenomenon here on the right is one called canopy avoidance. It's one you see in the tropics as well when you have broadleaf trees, where each leaf is fighting to get its space in the sun. Remember that this is dark for half of the year. Uh, so um, photosynthesis and the sunlight is very precious for making sugars and food and keeping the keeping the uh, individuals going. So they're competing for light. Here you are up on top of this mesa. Everything is stunted. This is that rata tree, but it's converted into a bush because of the winds. This is an example of these mega herbs. It's thought that uh, these are regular shrubs that have evolved this a mega giant form, again, uh, to maximize photosynthesis. So they, it's given a name. There, there's a, only a few handful of species, but this cabbage-like look um, is um, unique to these islands. The, it, these were eaten um, by sailors to ward off scurvy and that sort of thing. They call it a kind of cabbage. And on these islands, these are the Auckland Islands, there's another penguin called the yellow-eyed penguin. 
And he is very unique and very rare. And actually his numbers are declining, but this is another one of those endemic species because there were no predators, they evolved here. You can see this yellow eye um, giving it its name. And again, they're, they're, they're pretty cute, uh, but their population has severely declined. Some of the impacts are um, the fisheries, which um, use nets. And all of these creatures, everything I've talked about, gets caught in the nets and usually doesn't survive. Um, there are have also been all these predators introduced, which have gone into their nests and eaten the young and destroyed their burrows. And now they've they are restricting um, tourist access to most of these sites because they're trying to protect them. Another um, another um, endemic is a subspecies of the sea lion. Here they were actually having their babies and nursing. So that was fun to watch. So that gives you an idea of what these places look like. They're, they have these great um, new species and you're excited to see those. But the story I really want to get into here is how these islands are purposefully being recovered because of the insults, the onslaughts, of cats, rats, and rabbits that were brought in over the years by various sailors. They were predators, they acted as predators, they ate the young in uh, ground-based nests, and we didn't always know uh, what the impacts were. Um, and because of this widespread invasion of these uh, cats, rats, and rabbits, New Zealand has adopted a restoration policy. They want to be predator free by 2050. So they are pouring large amounts of effort and money into eradicating rats, possums, stoats, uh, the rabbits and so on. So all these islands have some sort of restoration program attached to them. So we start back in the early 1800s with these guys, these darling fur seals, which uh, when the Macquarie was first discovered, the sealers and the whalers came and they wiped these guys out. Their fur was highly, much <laughs> highly in demand. Um, it's dense, it's soft, it's beautiful. This is the same story in South Georgia, except that in South Georgia, a very small remnant population remained on a small group of offshore islands, and they now have repopulated South Georgia. But that is not true here in these islands. They've simply been eliminated for their fur. But along with the sailors also came the cats and the rats. The rats are always on, um, on, um, on ships, um, and they're down in the uh, wherever the food is on the on the ship so the sealers put their sometimes put their food ashore and then they brought cats purposefully in order to eat the rats and protect their food stores so the cats were introduced and then in the 1890s we started harvesting the penguins and the elephant seals for their oil so here is Mr. Hatch was one of the first entrepreneurs, the biggest entrepreneur on Macquarie. So his source of supply is this elephant seal and he is making harness oil. And here's his other brand, Penguin Machine Oil from Macquarie Island. That'll do, Penguin. May contain traces of seal. <laughs> So um, what they did was they uh, captured and killed the seals and the penguins, and they boiled them in massive vats on the beach. A bull um, elephant seal will give you about a half a ton of oil, and penguins you'll, penguins, you'll get about a half a pint per penguin. So you can imagine that 
about 70% of the elephant seal population was wiped out. Finally, in the late 1800s, um, the um, uh, practice was stopped. And most of the, they think that most of the penguin populations have recovered, but the sea lion, I mean, the elephant seals, they think are still um, building their populations back. Here's a historic photo of them rolling the barrels of oil from the, uh, uh, the, the rendering spots on the beach out to a dinghy, and then it goes off to some ship that takes it off to market. So they estimate that 2 million penguins were killed over three, 30 years or so. So we're not done yet. Um, the sailors, uh, the sealers got bored of eating whatever they were, whatever their regular ration was, and they decided to bring in rabbits. So they let the rabbits off onto the island, and guess what? They exploded, and they ate absolutely everything down to a nubbin. There's vast areas of erosion, exotic grasses came in, and the seabirds that burrowed and had their nesting sites underneath the grass clumps were um, were lost. They, they lost their, um, their nesting sites. Here you can see these big tussock uh, grass clumps have been eaten down to nubbins. The grass is gone and all the little rooty bases are showing. Here you see the erosion where birds, nest, ground nesting birds used to nest. Here is more up close of the rabbit damage to the bird nests. And these are your petrels and uh, various species. So this is fairly early. In, in the late 60s, the government decided to try to eradicate some of the rabbits. Well, uh, how do you get rid of a, rabbit, a huge rabbit population? Well, they introduced a virus, and this virus was actually a European virus. But to get the virus to work, you first had to introduce the flea. So that the flea would be the vector to carry, carry the uh, rabbit virus. So they first introduced the flea, and then they brought in the virus. And lo and behold, the rat population fell from hundreds of thousands down to 20. And they said 20,000, and, and the vegetation started to come back. And they said, hurrah. But if there's fewer rabbits, the, ra the cats, which were at that point living off of the rabbits, the cats turned away from rabbits and they started eating the seabirds. This is my point is you cannot do just one thing. Um, so, so, the, so the gray petrel was greatly affected uh, by the uh, lack of rabbits and the cats turning on to the petrels as uh, prey. This is a photo from Kauai, but it shows the same thing. The cat at night eating, predating on, on ground nesting uh, birds. So then they decided, all right, how are we going to get rid of the cats? They started with cages and leg hold traps. And finally, they just went in with hunters, sharpshooters, and they just um, shot them. So they, the last cat was believed to have been shot in the year 2000. So another hurrah, we got rid of the cats. But we're not done yet. With the cats gone, then the rabbits came back. There were still some left. And this is an example of when you keep, uh, th this is plant growth, when the rabbits are kept out of it. This is an exclosure. <laughs> showed you the effect of the rabbit grazing. And without the cats, then the rat population came back. So you see this history of insults and this ecological rebalancing um, that was frustrating all these attempts to eradicate the species one by one. Finally, they got their act together. The Australian and Tasmanian governments ponied up $25 million to go after all the species all at once. And this is what that program looks like. They used poison 
to get the rats and the mice and the rabbits. And then they also uh, reintroduced the virus for the rabbits. This is what this bait operation looks like. And if you saw the South Georgia presentation, this is very much the same technique because South Georgia also suffered from uh, rats and they, that they wanted to exterminate. All, all of this has to be brought in by ship. The Macquarie is so far away, you can't fly there. There's no landing pad. There's You can't fly a helicopter there. So you have to come in with the helicopters on the ship and all the equipment needed for this massive bait operation. So this uh, bait is like a uh, warfarin. It uh, affects the blood clotting of the prey. Um, and it comes in in these white bags and it's loaded into hoppers and the helicopter then takes it up and flies uh, specific transects through the island. Here's what the bait looks like. Um, the key to success is delivery of fresh bait using large storage containers that can keep it protected from weather condensation and pests. So here they are testing the hopper. And then the program launches and these helicopters went up and down this 20 mile uh, long island in three long transects and then they went back in targeted areas. They did a lot of this in the winter because then the green bait would be the preferred food for the rabbits and the rodents. They, they could see it and it was all there was to eat. And it worked. Um, there was a, a very high mortality. Uh, they did not want the carcasses of the um, pests left on the ground to be eaten up the food chain by other predatory animals, particularly the birds. So in addition to the baiting operation, they brought in dogs to sniff out all the carcasses. The dogs were trained not to harm the native animals. And they thought it was going to take three years to get rid of all signs of the pests, but it really only took them seven months. They monitored, because this poison would work its way up the food chain, they did do some um, population estimates of effects, um, and then they've done more follow-up studies since then. So they, they got the dogs. And in all this harsh weather, they went back and forth and back and forth looking for any possible survivors of these species. And then they did two years more of monitoring with bait sticks and more dogs and people looking. And, and they were looking for any, any sign at all that anybody was left. And finally, after seven years of doing this in 2014, they declared the program a success. And now you will not find a rat, a cat, or a rabbit on Macquarie. In response, the plants are coming back. So these mega herbs, this is a daisy, it's coming back, and the tussock grass is coming back, and the nesting, ground nesting petrels, the gray and the blue ones, are coming back as well. So this is a, a success story of recovery. It's still in progress, but um, it worked. Okay, so now the skuas, which are the top predator, um, and they had relied a lot on the rabbits, and now the rabbits are gone. So what do the skuas do? They turn to the penguins. So this is now finding its own balance. Um, and the skuas were, be, being a predatory bird, they were uh, somewhat affected by the bait and up the food chain. But they um, believe that at least three quarters of their population is now back to what it was before the, before the program. So here's a quote from this recent paper. While a decline in numbers was expected, um, the decline was not estimated at the time. This study quantified the true impact. And while it was substantial in the short term, the skewers are now showing strong signs of recovery. 
So the question is, well, doesn't this affect others? Yes, it does. But in this case, they have recovered. Here's the skua actually eating penguin eggs. With all this effort, they want to make darn sure that tourists, visitors are not going to reinfect with anything. So before any time we got off uh, the Zodiac, if we were going to touch land, any of the islands, we had to clean everything. We had to go down to the lounge and sign a paper and be uh, checked by a crew member that we had vacuumed all our Velcro. It, this lady over here is taking tweezers to the grooves in her boot to make sure there's no seeds. Um, the ship has to anchor um, 500 meters offshore because... Rats can only swim 200 meters. So they're trying very hard to prevent any, any reinfestation. Uh, so real quickly, you now that you generally know the story, let me quickly um, just repeat it again on this other island, Campbell Island, a little bit different um, aspects here. Here's an overview of um, one of the bays in Campbell Island. And this is home to teeming populations of albatross, just beautiful al albatross. You'll see them shortly and a lot of other species. And it had its own share of introductions. The rats were brought in in 1810. And then here they brought in sheep and then cats were introduced that wiped out the native birds and insects as well. This thing is a cicada kind of thing called a ground weta and it was exterminated. Um, because of of um, these um, uh, invasives. So the first thing they did was to get rid of the sheep. The sheep were no longer economic. They had sort of been turned loose. They were overgrazing the island. So they started herding them up. They took some of them off the island back to New Zealand. Uh, and others, at the end of the day, they finally just shot the remaining ones. And that allowed the vegetation to start coming back. Then they launched on the rat removal. Actually, Campbell had more rats than Macquarie did. So again, the poison bait, uh, the intensive planning for the eradication, the hoppers, the bait bags. Here's their base camp of operations. And this is quite um, steep, treacherous. It's hard to, hard to get in here. Um, uh, it was, you know, bad weather and all that, but they did manage to eradicate the rat. And guess what? This is a bird called the Campbell Island teal. And it's very similar to our green wing teal that we have here at the Arcata Marsh. And it had been declared extinct because of the rats. But there, they found 11 birds on a tiny little island group offshore of Campbell that had only one female. Daisy. So they captured them all, kind of like our condors up here. Uh, they took them in for captive breeding. It was hard to get Daisy to mate and lay eggs, but finally they figured it out. And so from this one population, they have built back, I mean, this one female, they have built back a population. And after they determined that the rats were gone, they brought the um, teal, reintroduced the teal. So this species that was declared extinct is now back. It looks something like this. And here we are in our zodiac, just slowly going along the shoreline. And there, there's one of these teal right here. So this is um, another success story. It's a general look at the tussock grass that is re-establishing. A uh, couple other species, here's nesting, you look in the grass and here's a nesting petrel. This red-billed gull is common throughout New Zealand, both islands and here. He's a pretty, very pretty elegant fellow. Um, here's the one conifer in the whole play, in the whole trip. <laughs> it's a Sitka spruce that was brought in by one of the, one of the sailors for whatever reason. Here's the shoreline. And just a few words about the albatross. There's several species of albatross here that are the lar some of the largest colonies um, globally. You can see them nesting. These are they uh, these are in the juvenile 
phase. Um, they, they're done with the actual nesting and the eggs, but these are the, the young that are getting ready to fly and they're just packed. They're just so dense. They're, they're swirling overhead. So you're just surrounded by them. Uh, this is a subspecies. This is the Campbell albatross. It's you can tell because of the shape of its eye and the color of the eye and so on. But this is the mark of a of a subspecies. Um, if you were in South Georgia, it would be the black browed albatross. So this is the Campbell version of it. And then the one of the biggest birds uh, we have is the southern royal albatross. This wingspan can be up to eleven feet. They're enormous. And they have to nest, these are nesting sites, and they have to nest in sites that they can launch. Um, it's very hard for them to get back up off the ground. Um, and this, you see these just uh, uh, off the bow of the ship, just floating by very, very gracefully. And one more albatross. Um, this is a particularly fancy one. It's called a molly mock. Uh, group. And it's a gray-headed one, but look at how pretty this head is and this fancy bill. It's known as the fastest flying bird on the planet, flying up to 80 miles an hour. But um, anyway, he was a, a catch to find him. A prion, if any of you have seen the, the prions, a small, nice, very common bird off the bow. And the petrels. I don't want to give you too many birds here, but one thing to note um, is this tube right here. So that both the albatross and the petrel spend huge amounts of time at sea. They're just soaring, going very long distances. So how do they drink and how do they eat? How do they find food? You're, you're on a ship and you're looking out at these vast expanses of ocean and it all looks identical to you. Where would you decide to dive to find a fish? Well, it turns out that there is uh, that the plankton, which are bubbling up in you know patches here and there, that are feeding the krill and feeding the fish that these guys want to eat, uh, they release a chemical called, called dimethyl sulfide, which these guys, the petrels and the albatross, can smell. So even though it looks like they're randomly diving into the ocean in some spot, it's because they actually smell this um, uh, dimethyl sulfide that's released and where fish are likely, likely to be. But the purpose actually of this tube-like thing, this is a petrel, so his tube is on the top. If it was an albatross, his tubes would be on the side. But the point is that they have a saline, ex a salt extraction gland above their eye that takes this um, salt that's in their blood and concentrates it and then gets rid of it by excreting it through this tube. And then usually you see these guys with a drip of salty water um, at the end of their at the end of their beak. Okay, so finally, we are turning north, and finally we get to go to the snares. Where the heck are the snares? Well, here they are. And why were they named the snares? Well, we have Captain George Vancouver of Vancouver Island fame, who said, these islands are in the way. They are a hazard to shipping, and they're snaring ships. And so he gave them the name, the snares. So in fact, the snares have such a steep shoreline that the sealers never came there. So the, the biota of the snares is pretty much intact. They were not invaded with all these, all these pests. But they do have, again, their own um, subspecies of penguin, the snares crested penguin, 
which nests up on top of the island, but then they have to come down to the water to uh, fish and eat. So here's there's caves, and we had fun um, going going through the caves. But here are these um, snares crested penguins. They're also a fancy fellow, kind of like a macaroni uh, penguin, but yellow. And the red eye, this nice nice red eye. So we went by this very large, slippery, slick rock. And here are these guys coming out of the water, hopping their way with their little feet all the way up, all the way up. And they also come back down when they want to come down to feed. But they go all the way up this thing, hopping their way up and back into their cover underneath the uh the vegetation up here. This is a great shot. Here they are coming down to the water and they look just like us. You know, we'd be looking down and gripping on with our feet <laughs> to get down to the water. And here they are taking off to um, go off fishing. So we spent some time, it was a beautiful day. It was really amazing um, puttering through these, through these caves and so on. We did see dolphin. I'm sorry, I don't know which species of dolphin, but uh, that was always fun to catch that. So there you have it. That's the, that is the story of the recovery efforts, what these islands, these remote, um, wild, windy islands look like. Um, they are remote. They're exposed to extreme weather. Because of the upwelling, they support these teeming populations of birds and marine mammals. Over a century, they've been um, insulted with exploitation and extraction and invasive species. And now we can actually, we're old enough to see the wheel turn and we can actually see recovery due to the hard efforts and expensive efforts to bring these islands back. Um, and just like um, places we know around here, the Prairie Creek restoration and the dams coming down and the restoration that we're engaged in all over Redwood Country, nature fights back. And if we give it a chance, <laughs> it will um, come back, which I think is very, very encouraging. The salmon, you know, find the newly open stream and the open bridge and the open culvert and all that. And so bit by bit, um, there's there's hope. And that's really the message I want to leave us with. Um, but, you know, there's always that tempering of the message that um, they have to now survive the new impacts of climate change and overfishing and whatever other modern insult we throw at them. So that's the story of those. I thought I have a minute or two left here. Let me uh, just give you one more really cool bird colony. This is on the North Island of New Zealand um, at Cape Kidnappers at Hawke's Bay. And these are gannets. They are a beautiful bird. And they're, uh, they've had their nesting season. These lumps, uh, round lumps are their uh, nests where the egg used to be and now <laughs> this one always strikes me as uh, bless you my flock um, it's just a great great photo but here they are these mounds where the egg is laid and then the juveniles uh, are getting pretty old here they're ready getting ready for their molt and ready to take off feeding and just a really pretty bird. So I will say farewell for now. Well, you have yeah. comments saying, thank you, thank you. One yeah, of the best Laura. presentations she's ever seen, that's Julie oh. Wilkerson. Oh. <laughs> and that yeah. is a wonderful laugh, look at that. Yeah, Kia Ora is like aloha, um, that they say the Maori, the New Zealand phrase. Okay. Dan Hazu says, thank you. Great trip. Great presentation. So Doug, wonderful presentation. 
Are there any questions from anybody? I have a question. Would you go back or would you give a presentation on some of the other areas you've been? Oh, um, you and I could talk uh, offline about uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, other possibilities. Yeah, these are wonderful. Are you planning another trip? I have a project right now. I, I'm having to restrain my um, impulse to book a trip because I am actually building a house next door. And that's that's my focus. That's my focus for this year. But yes, absolutely, I will plan more trips. Well, this is wonderful. And are you still going to the uh, uh, world? No. Uh, your question, yeah, mm -hmm. your question is, am I going to the UN negotiations? Um, I went to those for 12 years and I went all over the world. Um, Africa, Dubai, Poland, Bali, uh, Warsaw, you know, all over the world. Um, and this was the period in the lead up to the Paris Agreement when it was intellectually very interesting. It was policy formation. It was intellectually just captivating. And I was primarily tracking the development of forest a policy avoiding tropical deforestation. Hey, how are you? Yeah. And, oh, and markets, the, the development of carbon. Right. And so um, after Paris was signed, I went to two or three. Well, a nice day. Oh, somebody's also talking. Howard, would you please mute? Yeah, what has happened? is the the whole the whole thrust of the cops the um uh conference of the parties has changed to one of not putting an agreement together but actually implementing the agreement and so the conversation is fascinating but it's much more diffuse it's country by country the policy issues have most mostly now revolve around finance and um, anyway, I I have sort of retired from actually attending those. I keep up with them online. Um, but uh, okay, so okay. I'm just now able to get to the chat. Oh, somebody went sailed past these islands. Robert passed in 1985. Yeah, that's interesting. Great. It takes a lot of work to undo what we've done. <laughs> um, true. Uh, yes. Um, and it takes uh, years. Uh, focus, focus. Yeah, focus years, knowing what you're doing, putting the science behind it, uh, having the tools to work with. Um, this this uh, bait is being used now in many island groups to try and eradicate on the um, two main islands of New Zealand, you see uh, cage traps everywhere. And every little park you go to, you see these uh, cage traps for whatever, whoever may be there for uh, rats, for stoats, for possum, that sort of thing. So they're, they're working on it. As I said, New Zealand's goal is, uh, is, is, uh, to be predator free by 2050. That gives them a few few more years yet, right? <laughs> They've yeah. got a lot of work to do, most likely, because we've been there all over the place. But yeah. they're divided into a whole variety of different locations. So maybe it can do it one by one. Well, yeah, you can see the impact of uh, island bio island biogeography is particularly vulnerable because they're islands and um, they're populated with whatever survived and got to them at the very beginning. Yeah. And then they went off and had their speciation and adaptations. And so anything that comes in after that is obviously going to have a big impact on who's there. Okay. So I, want to th I want to thank you ever so much. And I know a whole variety of people have put comments to that effect in the chat and want to suggest that everybody 
come back for next Monday, uh, where Lori Dangler will be talking about the shaky history of the California's North Coast and, and talking about the, how seismically active we are and why and how that works and how we might want to think about that um, and how to prepare yourself for it. And we just had one. She just, as she said in the paper, she had to divert her article because, oops, we had another little earthquake. Four point, I guess when I first saw it, it said 4.6 in Fortuna, and then it became 4.8 in, in Ferndale. <laughs> she ended up saying it's 4.7. So in any event, we yeah. felt it, but we didn't feel the one that was 4.2 at about, I think, at 10.30 or sometime a little bit later. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. Thank you ever so much, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Meantime, have a great week. It's going to be a little warmer in here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you. Bye-bye.